So use p equals 17, q equals 19. They are the large prime numbers I chose. Well, they're not large enough for security, but just for this example. And then calculate calculate your public and private key. What's the first step? What are you, what's the first step you're going to do? Times them together. Get an n. P times Q equals n. And then the next step, find the totient of n. Anyone find n? What's the value? 323. Three, three. Then find the totient of n. Keep calculating. And use the shortcut. This is the important part. That is, you don't need to find the totient of n manually. You, because it's n is two prime numbers multiplied together, the totient of n is p minus 1 times q minus 1. And the value is two two eight eight. Okay. For those. What's next? Find E. And there are different possible values. It has to be relatively prime with 288. I don't know the, all the answers. There are, mul there are multiple values which are relatively prime with 288. That is greatest common divisor of E and the totient of N equals 1. Someone said seven. Any other numbers? Three. So is three is two hundred and eighty eight divisible by three? Okay, so three is not relatively prime. Because if if two hundred and eighty eight is divisible by three, then the greatest common divisor is three in that case. What about five? Five is relatively relatively prime with two hundred and eighty-eight because two hundred and eighty-eight is not divisible by five. They don't have the, the same factors. Seven. Seven is relatively prime, so we've got five, seven. There are possible values of e, and there are others. We're not going to go through them all. Uh, 9 will not be because 3 is not 11 most likely 13 is I think and there are others okay it's not the intention to calculate them all it's to, you just need to choose one in this case 
choose to make it a bit harder, choose 13. So you get to select one. Okay. Let's choose 13. What's next? Find D. How do we find D? The multiplicative inverse of E, which means when you multiply E and D together and mod by the totient of N, 288, you get 1. Okay? E times D equals 1 in mod 288. And here again you need to try some different values. So where E is 13, what we need is 13 times something mod 288 equals 1. You need to find that something. One way to, to make the attempts is some 13 times something equals 289. Or 289 divided by 13 equals an integer. And if that doesn't give you an integer, then try uh, 2 times 288 plus 1. 3 times 288 plus 1. You can just try different values. That one's a bit harder. Well, I can't remember the... Uh, did anyone get a... 23? What's 23 times 13? Hmm? We need a calculator. We have 13 times something. What are we? 289. Actually, my calculator is not so good. It's not accurate. Uh, let's make it easier. Thirteen times something equals one mod two hundred eighty-eight. That is, if we have two hundred eighty-nine divided by thirteen, we need to get an integer. Okay because if 13 times something equals 289 then 289 mod the totient of n equals 1. So if 289 is divisible by 13 by an integer then that's the answer, but it's not, you see, it's, it's 22. There must be a multiplicative inverse because that's the way we chose E. You have to keep trying. What about 13 times... What about uh, if it was... Is 577 divisible by 13? I'm not going to expect you to go through all because 577 mod 288 is 1. I hope because 288 times 2 is 576. So 577 mod 288 will be a remainder of 1 which is just 289 plus 288. And if that doesn't give you an integer here, then you add another 288. But I'll give you the answer. Because it takes, takes some time to calculate. 133 I calculated. 
133 times 13 mod 288 is 1. Try again. So E is 13. If D is 133, we get 1729. If you then mod by our totion of N, which is 288, you get 1. So there is a D, uh, it's just not, it, not obvious to calculate straight away. There are algorithms that will do that for you automatically. So if D equals 133, uh, we can use RSA. What's next? Well, we've generated our key pair. Because the key pair, in fact, is three, three values. One of them is repeated. E, D, and N are the values that we need. Because we use them for our RSA encryption and decryption. So now, let's say you... Uh, Let's say that that was my key pair. I generated this. I chose P and Q, 17 and 19. I calculated N. I didn't tell you what my P and Q were. I didn't tell you what D was. But I tell you that E equals 13 and N equals 323. So I tell you my public key. My public key is E and N. And then I, you want to send me a message. And you want that message to be confidential. That message is 22. Encrypt. Find the ciphertext. At least work out the equation for the ciphertext. We'll use a calculator to solve it. Normally we, we denote the public key as both E and N and the private key as D and N. But the one thing that must be private is D. Even though we say N is part of the private key, the private value is D because N is public in the public key. But some, it's quite common to denote N as part of the private key as well because we use that when we use the value of D. So now for confidentiality, someone wants to send me a message, that's my public key and my corresponding private key, then what do you do? C equals the message 22. What do we do with E, uh, with M? We use, we use the public key. So when you send me a message, you use my public key. That is, you use my value of E and N. You take 22 to the message and raise it to the power of 13 and mod by N.
Anyone have the answer? Anyone have a calculator that will calculate it? Seventy one? Sounds sounds close. What do we get? We had twenty two to the power of thirteen mod three two three seventy one. Again, twenty two is our message raise it to the power of our public value e, which is 13, and then mod by our modulus n, which is 323. So here we're using the public key, e and n. Seventy one. So that's the ciphertext. That's what you would send me. Oh, sorry. What do I do when I receive 71? I receive this message 71 from you, what do I do with it? I want to get the original message back, I decrypt using the same equation but different values. So I want to find what M is. I've got, I take the ciphertext 71 and now I use the other key in the pair. You use the public key, I use the corresponding private key. That is the value of D. 71 to the power of 133 and the same value N. And try it on your calculator. You should get 22 back. Okay. Check. Anyone get it? Twenty two, can you show me on your calculator? Okay. So here we used E and here we use D. Other than that, the the operations are the same. So the ordering of the which we use the keys. Seventy one to the power of one hundred and thirty-three mod what do we get? Three two three. Our ciphertext to the power of the private value D mod N gives twenty two, which is what we expect. So that's just a simple example of with small values using RSA. The simple step or the steps for generating the key. I gave you the values of P and Q in this case. You need to choose, in general, choose random, choose large prime numbers. Any questions on how to do that in the quiz next week? You should be able to do it quickly in the quiz. Yep. There will be a quiz next week. You may have to do questions like this. But you may have other questions as well. I would not, I would try in a quiz, I would not ask you to I would not give a question which takes a long time, that is, you have to, especially this part. In this case, in this question, it takes a bit of time to find the value of D. I would try to choose numbers which you'll find the value of D either after one, or one two or three attempts. Okay? That's not the point to make it long, but just to understand the steps. I may not even ask you to do all the steps.
Uh, okay, there's an example in RSA. Some of the things that I mentioned before the break, what did I say? And I couldn't remember. So just a few other things. I said that there's something called AES-NI. NI, so this is a feature of Intel uh, CPUs. So most recent Intel CPUs uh, support this. And NI means new instruction. What it is is a set of instructions that perform some of the AES operations. If you remember back to DES, not AES, we didn't cover it in detail, but DES, we had different operations in each round. We had XORs, we had S boxes, and different operations. Well, there are, in the Intel CPU, there are instructions that uh, do specific operations in AES. It just speeds up by run using hardware to do the AES operations instead of software. What else did we mention that I want to just recap before we move on. Uh, I said, we said something about the speed. Uh, to give you some indicator, so here, this is the length of the number n that we're trying to factor into p and q. With RSA, that the challenge is, given a large n, find p and q. If I give you in the quiz question next week, break RSA and I give you the value of n, you may be able to factor it into a p and q. If I gave you n equals 323, I think some of you would find that the prime factors of 323 are our 17 and 19. Okay? So you can factor 323 into 17 and 19. But now take a, not a three digit number, but take a 200 or 300 digit number, maybe 700 bits, is n and factor that into p and q and this is how long some different algorithms take so if it's n is 600 bits long this is it's not so clear here I can't even read it uh, this is 10 to the 8 10 to the power of 6 MIPS years MIPS is millions of instructions per second okay MIPS millions of instructions per second this is 10 to the power of 6 that is one million millions of instructions per second years now to get that a bit more meaningful and of course if we go up in the length of n we see it goes up to 10 to the power of 12 and much higher uh, I just looked up some data um, how fast are current computers this is not to remember but just to give an indicator and an Intel i7 CPU is about 128,000 MIPS. That is, at peak performance, it can do about 128,000 million instructions per second. This is millions of instructions per second. How many years that we if we do that many instructions per second, how many years would it take? So, uh, maybe a better example, RSA 768, which was a 768-bit value, somewhere in here. Someone solved it in, this was in 2009. They factored this number, a 768-bit value of N, into its prime factors P and Q, it took them about the equivalent using one CPU, just one core, it took them 2,000 years. Or the equivalent of. That is, with a 768-bit value of N, if they had just one CPU, it would take 2,000 years. Of course, they had more than one CPU, one core. They had multiple computers factoring over a long period of time. And it took them, I think, in the order of... Uh, uh, I think in their case, the first time they did it, in the order of two years. Okay. So instead of 2,000 years, by increasing the number of computers, they can reduce the, the real time. But that's the order of magnitude that we're talking about. That's the most recent one that was solved. Generally considered, 
now 1024 bits considered secure for now 2048 bits is recommended for using RSA to be secure in the future and it's considered that it's un unbreakable uh, with any known technique just some numbers to indicate that if we use a large enough N it's practically impossible to break uh, what other examples what if we use What if we use larger values? Can our calculator deal with it? Of course, uh, you need to be careful when you calculate uh, using RSA, even these small values, that your calculator, whether it's a handheld calculator or a, a computer calculator, actually has the precision to perform the operations. Because when we have a large M and we raise it to a large number, maybe we'll run out of precision in our calculator. Okay? So just be careful if you're doing some practical tests or some uh, tasks at home or for homework that sometimes the calculators are not precise enough. Uh, for example, uh, actually I, I don't have a, a, an example, but if we take a large number um, a large M for example and raise it to the, a large value of D let's see how, see how good my calculator is okay again oh, we'll go back in a minute so my calculator could calculate it in some period of time but it says it's 10 to the power of 70,000 it doesn't remember those 70,000 uh, digits there Okay, it would not be accurate enough to then take the modulus and get the answer. So sometimes you need special software or different algorithms to, to do the, the power and the mod uh, together. And some software will do it, uh, others will not. Um, you've seen me before use something called BC on the command line. I'll zoom in. BC is just a calculator on the command line, it, but it's uh, arbitrary precision. So it's better for calculating uh, the power and modulus for large numbers. We'll see some other examples later, but let's see. It's not as good as others. But okay, it will. All right. It doesn't make much sense here, but it gives the exact number here. Whereas my other calculator, my graphical calculator, would just record 10 to the power of 70,000 and something. It wouldn't record all of the precise values. Here in BC, it will record the exact number, and therefore, we, when we do the mod, in theory, we can get the precise answer. So just be careful. Sometimes your calculator will not handle the numbers we're dealing with. And when we deal with real numbers with RSA, again, it takes some time and you need efficient algorithms to calculate. Uh, another example before we look at Diffie-Hellman. OpenSSL supports RSA key generation. So let's generate some keys with OpenSSL. And you don't need to remember these. I'll provide you a link to where this is written up. But I'll just demonstrate the generation of an RSA key. Uh, and we'll look at that key. So open SSL. There are different functions it has. But it has a generic operation to generate a private key, gen p key. And it works for different algorithms. It works for RSA, DSS, and others. So we can select an algorithm. I want to use RSA. And you can specify different options for your private key. Minus P key OPT for options. And I know these. I've looked them up in advance. They're not easy to remember. One of the options is to specify the RSA 
key generation, the number of bits, 2048 in my case. That is, how long is N? Okay. So that's the main indicator of the, the performance or the, the strength of RSA, is the number of bits. So I will use a 2048 uh, length value. And the other one we can specify as an option is the value of our public exponent. E, that is. That is the, the number we raise to a power which is made public, the public exponent, it's called in OpenSSL. And as we said, that value can be small and we can use the same value. And in this example, I'll just use three. Okay. So when you generate your key, you can also use three. You can use a different number, uh, but three is one of the ones which is known, it's small and therefore can be efficient. And so that will generate my private key and I want to output to a file. Let's call it PRIV. And there's a particular file format, I'll just call it .pem. That's not so important yet. So just some options to generate my RSA key pair. And let's see, it takes a little bit of time, well, about one second. Okay, it generates, uh, what it did then is it chose the two prime, uh, two, yeah, two prime numbers, P and Q. So what it did is it really chose large random numbers and then test if it's prime, if it's not prime, if it's found to be composite, then try another large random number. And do multiple tests and there's a high confidence that it will be prime after multiple tests and then it does that for Q. Then it calculated N, the totion of N, selected an E, calculated D and saved those values in a file, this PRIV.PM. Let's look at the file. It's a text file, or ASCII content, but it's encoded. So if I just display that file on the screen, it looks like some random characters. I'll zoom out so it's a bit... That's it there. In fact, it's not encrypted. This is my private key. It's not encrypted, it's just a different encoding. It's a base64 encoding. You know you have ASCII encoding, a way to map the letters to binary values. This is a different encoding which has been used to send uh, binary data across a network. So it's an encoding, not encryption. Uh, OpenSSL SSL has a way to show it in a user-friendly way. That's not so easy for me to look at. It's an operation to view the values. take the input, my private key, and output to a text display. So this is, this is the encoded form of my private key containing all those values. We'll see in a, in a moment. I'm just going to display it in a user-friendly manner. And just display one screen at a time. Okay, that's the same as before. And now it provides a nicer view. So the first thing is the, is the modulus here. It's given in hexadecimal, you can convert it to binary. So there's the modulus there. That was determined by P times Q. The public exponent, E, and that's three, I chose that in this example. And the calculated private, private exponent, that's D. So we have N, E, and D. And note that D is very large. Okay, it's almost as large as N in this case. So it's almost 2048 bits long. And that's desirable. We want for security D to be large. And that's one reason for choosing a small E. Normally with a small E you get a, a large D because E and D are multiplicative inverses. 
then my private key, OpenSSL, actually stores other values. So we have, what do we have? So far we have N, E, and D. So in fact, it says it's my private key, but it also stores E. So in fact, it stores my public values as well. But it stores also my primes, P and Q. So prime 1 and prime 2, they're called. So they are the large prime numbers which were chosen by the software in this case and recorded there. So it has P and Q. And finally it stores some other values called exponent 1, exponent 2 and coefficient. These values are not needed but they are stored because they can be used to make the, uh, the, the decryption using the private key, using D, faster. As remember when we take some value and raise it to the power of D mod N, D is very large and it takes a lot of time to take some large number, raise it to the power of another large number mod N. There are some algorithms that can uh, simplify this calculation and the algorithms rely on some other values and those other values are stored also with my private key and they are called exponent 1, exponent 2 and the coefficient. We're not going to explain how they used. Um, you can see online different sources explain them. I have them written down somewhere. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. If I don't have them written down, I'll show you another time. No, I don't. Exponent 1 and exponent 2 are some operation on D, I think mod P minus 1 and exponent 2 D mod Q minus 1 and the coefficient also uses P and Q. They are simply used to perform this calculation in a faster manner. Instead of having to perform the, the direct operation there are multiple steps and it turns out those steps using these sort of sub values can be implemented faster than that one step. So it's for performance, not for security. They're not needed, but they're commonly used. That's my private key. Of course, I would not show you that because that's private to me, especially the values of these and uh, the primes should be kept secret. And of course, the private exponent should be kept secret. The values of N and E, I can show you because they can be public. The others should be kept private or secret. And OpenSSL can then generate a, a public key from this. And I could save that in a file and then send it to you or post on a web, website such that anyone can see my public key. And then you could encrypt, again using OpenSSL or other software, and send me ciphertext. So just an example with OpenSSL and generating the key. Any questions on RSA? That brings us to the end of that topic. Another public key cryptography algorithm is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm. And we'll start to go through that this afternoon. Remember the, the two people, Diffie and Hellman, they are the people who publicly, uh, were the first to publish public key cryptography. They're the, the two guys that invented public key cryptography, at least made it public. There were some se security organisations that, that did it before them, but it wasn't published. And there's an algorithm that they developed for exchanging keys. 
So this is different from what we've seen all along. We've seen RSA can be used for encryption, for confidentiality. I have some plain text, I encrypt it, I send the cipher text so that no one can see the plain text. RSA we've seen also can be used for authentication. I have a message, I authenticate it by signing it using my private key. I send that signed message and the receiver verifies it using my public key. So RSA provides those two services. Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange is about exchanging a secret. Remember with DES, AES, even RC4, they both use one secret at both the source and destination. There's one secret key. The problem with them is how do we get that secret? How does the destination know what the secret is? Well, Diff Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange is a way for exchanging a secret using public key cryptography. Let's see how it works. So it's not for secrecy of data, so we're not encrypting anything. All we're doing is we're trying to get a secret from one spot to another, so from one user to another user, without anyone else discovering that secret. So that's the challenge here. We've mentioned this in previous class. How do I get a secret from one user to another user? I write it down on a piece of paper and give it to them. Right? How do we do it across a network? If I send this secret in an email, unencrypted, then potentially someone can intercept that email and see my secret. That's not secure. Right? If I send that secret, I could encrypt it and send the encrypted secret in an email. How do I do that? Okay, I have a secret, I choose it, I want to send it to someone. I cannot send it in the clear because someone could intercept. So one thing I could, could do is encrypt that secret and send the ciphertext in the email. Would that work? How could I do that? What do I encrypt it with? I could encrypt it using RSA, for example, and use, if I want to send the message to you, I would use your public key to encrypt and send the ciphertext to you, and you would use your private key to decrypt. So that's one way for exchanging secrets, and it's a key use, or the important use of RSA to exchange secrets. Diffie Hellman's another way. It doesn't use RSA, it uses its own algorithm for exchanging a secret, for getting one secret from A to B. It's the security of it, the strength of it, is based upon the fact that discrete <coughs> logarithms are hard to solve. In that when we use modulo, modular arithmetic, we can easily calc calculate exponentials, but doing the inverse, the inverse of an exponential in modular arithmetic is a discrete logarithm. Calculating discrete logarithms is hard. With large enough numbers, it's practically impossible. That's the, where the security comes into it. Here's the algorithm. Uh, let's quickly explain it and then demonstrate with an example. There are some public, what's called global public elements. Two numbers. Globally public means everyone knows them. So if I want to exchange an ex secret with someone else, we must use the same values of these two parameters and they can be public in that everyone can know them. Q and alpha. Q is a prime number. Alpha is a number less than Q and a primitive root of Q. We've spoken about primitive roots when we looked at number theory. We'll see an example again to remind you. So let's say I choose Q I find alpha, a primitive root in mod Q, and I tell you, and at the same time I tell everyone. Everyone knows those two values, they're public. It's not a problem. And there's two users, A and B. We both want to have a secret, and we're going to exchange messages across a network, and no one else should be able to find out that secret. 
And the steps are quite easy. User A selects some private value, x of A, or x subscript A. I select some private value, any number, as long as it's less than Q. And I calculate a public value Y. And the way I calculate it is I take the alpha raised to the power of my x mod by Q. And you do the same thing. Okay, the other user, B, chooses some other random value, x, less than Q, and calculates a y, yb, in the exact same manner. Take their x, alpha to the power of their x mod Q. Alpha and Q are the same at both users. xA and xB will be different because we choose them independently. And we calculate yA and yB. yA and yB are public in that anyone can know the values. What we do is we send them publicly across a network. Okay? So we can send them in an email, don't have to be encrypted, I can yell them out, tell you my value of YA is this, and you would tell me your value of YB. Everyone else would hear them. Once we get the other person's value of Y, each user calculates K as the other user's y raised to the power of my x mod q. And the user b takes user a's y raised to the power of their x mod q. And it turns out you get the same value of k at both sides. And we'll show that if someone intercepts our messages and they know q, they know alpha, they know y a, and yb, so they know those four public values, it's practically impossible for them to determine k, so long as we use large enough numbers. Let's try and give an example to show that. Let's find my example. So the values of Q and Alpha are, are chosen by one of the users and made public to everyone. So I will choose the values of Q and Alpha to get started. I'll choose small values so we can calculate. Uh, I'll so Q is a prime number. I'm going to choose Q equal to 103. Okay. So we choose a prime number. And then we choose alpha, which is a primitive root of Q. Remember, a primitive root is when we take that number and raise it to the power of 1, mod Q, raise it to the power of 2, to the power of 3, to the power of 4, up to alpha to the power of 102, and all of the answers will be distinct will be different numbers. If that's true, then it's a primitive root. Uh, I don't have an easy way to calculating that without manually trying them, but I just looked up on a table. Do I have the, uh, let's see if I can find one. So here's just a, a website, uh, Math World from Wolfram, and it describes primitive roots, but I just looked up, it has a table of some of the primitive roots of different numbers. So it's zoom in. It's just a table. It says 
in the first column is the number and the second column is the smallest primitive root. There are multiple primitive roots of some numbers, but it gives just one primitive root. So, for example, a primitive root of 19 is 2. And the, then we have more numbers. The, a primitive root of 54 is 5. There may be others, but it's just given one example. What we do is choose a prime number. I chose 103. And this table tells me a primitive root of, five, of 103 is 5. There are others, but 5 is one that we can use. So I will use my prime number Q as 103 and alpha as 5 in this case. You could check that. What you would do, and you can do it in software, calculate 5 to the power of 1 mod 103, 5 to the power of 2 mod 103, 5 to the power of 3 mod 103 and keep going up to 5 to the power of 102 mod 103. You calculate all those values and the set of answers would be distinct values. No answer would repeat. That's the definition of the primitive root. So the answer here would not repeat in the set of the answers. Then. We'd get the values, so the set of values would be from 1 up to 102 in some different order. Let's go back to our Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So Q chosen to be a prime number, 103, and let's use alpha equal to 5. So user A, let's do both sides. User A chooses some value of xa. And it needs, needs to be less than 103. I need two volunteers. One volunteer. Anyone else? Two volunteers. You can be a and you're b. Choose a number less than 103. That's easy. Any number less than 103. 19. So these are the two users and they're doing this separately. Okay, so this is on one, one computer and then the other user. So user A chose 19. I'll record this. And at the same time we'll do user B and see what user B does. User B, what do you choose? Anything. 21. Okay? So they choose those numbers randomly, independently. They could be the same number, but uh, unlikely, especially if we have large numbers. Okay? Normally, Q is very large, and therefore, when you choose a number between one and a large number, two people are not going to choose the same number. So they've chosen their values independently. And then they each calculate their value of y. And they use the same algorithm. We take alpha, raise it to the power of our x, and mod by q. So 5 to the power of 19, mod 103. User A, do you know the answer? Answer? Can someone help her? 5 to the power of 19, mod 103. 
Okay, need a calculator. I will help. Five to the power of nineteen mod one hundred three eighty six. Okay. And user B does the same thing at their side. What do we get? 86. And user B does, they calculate their YB. So that's a lowercase b. Which is 5, the same value of alpha to the power of 21 mod 103, the same Q. And the answer? Hmm? 19. 90. Okay. Nine. <laughs> slow rider. It's okay. Okay, so they calculate those values independently. They haven't exchanged anything yet. They both know the same Q and alpha. Now they send each other their values of Y. Okay, so user A sends 86 to user B, and similar, B sends back their value, 90. So that's the first communications. All right? They could have communicated before to exchange Q and alpha, but they do not exchange X, just the values of Y. And now they calculate their values of K. Let's call it KA. So user A takes the received value of Y. So user A takes YB, 90 in our case, they just received 90, and they raise it to the power of their private value X. So user A uses the received value 90, raise it to the power of 19. and mod by Q. So again, when we receive the value 90, which is YB, the public value of user B, we take that, raise it to the power of our private value X and mod by Q, and our calculator tells us, calculator, Mr. Calculator, please. Hmm? 37. Good. So you, you need a calculator to get that one. User B follows the same steps. They calculate KB. They take the received value, 86, raise it to their private value, 21. That's a 1. And mod by 103. Magically, what do they get? 37. They get the same value. We'll show later why. It's quite easy mathematics to see that they'll always get the same value. But first, let's summarize what happened. Q and alpha are public. They are known. Let's say at the start, the two users exchanged Q and alpha. Everyone knows. X is, let's say, randomly chosen independently at each side. No, you don't tell anyone your value of X. You calculate Y, and both users exchange their values of Y. So we say Y is a public value, X is a private value. And then calculate the value of K independently using the other person's Y, your X, mod by Q, and the other person does that using what the value of y they received, mod, this is 21, their x, mod 103, sorry, 86 to the power of 21, mod 103, and you'll get the same value. And that's the secret. The secret is 37 in this case. The goal of this is to get a secret at both users, A and B, they know a secret, the same secret, 
and no one else knows the secret. And what can a malicious user do? Well, you need to consider what the malicious user knows. What is known is Q alpha, they are public, and what's exchanged across the network, or what is communicated. So 86 and 90 are known. That is why A and why B are known by the malicious user. So the challenge is then, given those four values, find 37. Try it. So there's two things we need to cover. We may not cover them today, but why do we always get the same value K at both sides? We'll have a look at that shortly. And more importantly, why is this secure? Why can't someone else come along and discover 37? So let's look at that. What do we know? So now we consider the malicious user, the attacker. We know alpha equals 5. We know q equals 103. And the malicious user also knows what was sent across the network, which is, what do we have? Ya, what was that? 90, is that right? 86, 86. And they also not, uh, know YB, which is 90. They know that because it was sent across a network or across some communications medium. No encryption. It's public. So now, given those values, find K. So if you look at the equations, what, so the user also knows the algorithm. So I'll write down some of the equations that we have. Uh, for example, we know that K and KA and KB are the same. So K is, for example, YB, that's a YB to the XA mod Q. That's one part of the equation. The other one is YA to the XB mod Q. And they also know what is YB? The equation for YB, which is known, is alpha to the XB, that's a B, mod Q. And in fact, there's two other equations for the equivalent, but uh, YA, XB, and alpha to the XA equals YB, but just from the other user's perspective. The challenge now is for the attacker to, given this known information, find K. What do they do? What do they need to do? To find K, YB is known. Q is known. Is XA known? No. So there's an unknown. If we have an equation we have two unknowns. We need to find out. If we find XA, then we can easily find K. Okay, so the first step then is find XA. Because once we get XA, Q, a K can be calculated. So how do we find XA? And I'll write down another equation that is known from the other side. YA equals alpha xa mod q. So the challenge is to find xa. Focus on this equation. An equation with four variables, what's known? q is known. Okay, the attacker knows Q. Alpha is known. And YA is known. YA is 86, alpha is 5, and Q is 103. So here we have an equation with four variables, three known values. We want to find the unknown value. 
how do we find xa? Or what's the inverse of this equation? What's the, the operation? Here we have an exponential in modular arithmetic. The inverse of exponential is a logarithm, a discrete logarithm. Remember back uh, let's try that again. A discrete log our base is alpha our mod is q of ya and the answer of that discrete log will be xa. If that's clear Remember the discrete logarithm, the inverse of exponential. And the same as our normal arithmetic. We want to find the exponent. We want to find xa. So we take the logarithm. The log, the base is alpha, mod q of ya gives us xa, the exponent. So that's the inverse operation. So now the challenge for the attacker is to calculate a discrete logarithm. If they can do that, they will find xa. And once they find xa, they can easily calculate k and they know the secret. But you know that if we use large enough numbers, discrete logarithms are too hard to solve. There are even with a small alpha, if we have a large q and large values of uh, our x and, and subsequently y, solving the discrete logarithm is practically impossible. And that's where the security of this Diffie-Hellman key exchange comes in. So long as we use large enough numbers, even though the attacker knows alpha, q, y, a and y, b, they will not be able to find x, a because it takes too long to, find a dis to solve the discrete logarithm. And if they can't find x, a, they won't be able to find k, and hence it's secret. You could solve it in this case, because our numbers are small. You could uh, try different approaches. You could uh, use software. You could try a brute force approach. Uh, so you know alpha is 5. You know q is 103. ya is 86. When we take alpha and raise it to some power, 5 raised to some power mod 86, uh, sorry, mod 90 gives 86. Just try different values of xa and eventually you'll find the right one. But if we have large enough numbers, solving this is too hard. And hence k is secret. So that's why Diffie-Hellman works. It's quite simple. It's a way to exchange secret. A secret between two users. Yep. Too hard, I mean too long. That is, if you have large enough numbers and you set your computer or computers to solve this, it will take you thousands of years. Okay? Too long. Or uh, there's not enough compute power to solve it. Same with all the ciphers we talk about. When I say too hard, I mean practically even with supercomputers, it's going to take thousands of years to solve. Okay? That's about the security of Diffie-Hellman. The other thing we skipped over is why do we get k at both sides to be the same? You can solve that, I'm sure. So in Diffie-Hellman, check and see why when A calculates k and when B calculates k, they'll always get the same value. There's some simple rearrangements of the mathematics and to see that. I will not attempt to describe it because we're out of time. Okay.